Well, as ranchers, westerners, and thrill seekers, we love our rodeo, a sport which is currently dominated by white men, but can trace its origins to the Moors of Spain. The authors of a soon-to-be-published book sought to understand ethnic minorities and cowgirls' current roles in rodeo by tracing their roles throughout rodeo history. I had the pleasure of chatting with Tracy Owens Patton earlier about the book she's co-authoring called This Ain't My First Rodeo, a visual analysis of a hundred years of women and ethnic minorities in rodeo. Let's say at the turn of the century, what did it look like? I mean, what did the pictures show? So most of the pictures uh, mirror what we see today, which is you see white people engaging in some kind of rodeo, white men and women, they're the ones who are the most photographed. Men for sure are the most photographed, white women are second. And so what we wanted to do with this book was to show that there were other images that were taken at that same time in rodeo, but we don't always see them. Some of those iconic images that we may think back to and go, oh yeah, that person was in rodeo, that person was active in cowboy or cowgirl culture, but we normally don't think about those images whenever we think you know, rodeo, we think the Marlboro looking kind of man, not the Bill Pickett kind of man, or the Bonnie McCarroll, we think Marlboro man. So some of those images were there, but we just don't think about those iconic images anymore. Now, a portion of your book, if I'm understanding this correctly, goes back to the origins. And you're talking about other cultures, ethnicities, which a lot of these equestrian skills were taken from. Absolutely. Uh, rodeo was not invented in the United States. Rodeo actually is very multicultural, it's cross-cultural. If uh, anyone had the opportunity a couple of years ago to go to the American Heritage Center, they had a wonderful display of Greek culture. And in some of those images of ancient Greek culture, they had men per performing in rodeos. You know, catching, catching the bulls, chasing the bulls. And so if you actually take it from there, and that's where our book goes, is from ancient Greece, then we end up with the Moors. And the Moors were the people who taught the Spanish how to do rodeo. And then Christopher Columbus in 1494 took the Moors Spanish version of rodeo to the rest of Latin America, to then the Hispaniola, which is today's Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And from there, it moves up from the rest of Latin America up through the United States. I mean, if you think about the rodeo that we practice today, the rodeo that we can go and see, it's actually very Spanish influenced. And then from the vaqueros, who were just renowned for their work with the rope, horses, breaking horses, their kinship with animals, you go from the vaqueros, who then later taught American Indians as well as whites. And then that teaching goes forward to black people, black Americans. So something happened. Something, something happened where a lot of these um, original groups disappeared from, from rodeo. Well, rodeo is like any other organization within the United States, meaning that it's not immune from social issues. And the social issues of the day that impacted rodeo were many of the American apartheid laws, also known as Jim Crow. So some of those issues get put upon an organization and people get pushed out. And so while rodeo can claim that it had never been part of, uh, of isolation, like baseball was, where they had laws with segregation in them, rodeo followed the U.S. law, which was you know, no blacks. And there were actually signs, no blacks, no Mexicans, no dogs. And you can see that in many rodeo books. And so once you have institutions complying with racist U.S. law, by default you're going to be pushed out, even if you are talented in that sport. The same thing happens with American Indians as well, and being rounded up and put on reservations also contributes to that. I've talked to Abe Morris, who's a very, very successful competitive bull rider. So somehow, some of these folks have just had enough determination, combined with talent, to stick it out. Oh, well, sure. I mean, Abe is standing on the shoulders of those who said, okay, I am in a sport that won't allow me in, well, what can I do? Well, American Indians, Latinos, and blacks decided to create their own rodeo organizations. So they may not have been able to participate in the PRCA, for example, Pro Rodeo Cowboys Association, but they were able to ride and, and be part of rodeo culture within their own ethnic group's sport. 
So you have people who participated that way. Then you have people like uh, Murtis Deitman. And he was someone who said, you know what, I realize that there is the Black Cowboy Association. But you know what, I'm going to try and see if I can get into the Pro Rodeo Association. So he rides, he does, he was so significant, he's seen as the Jackie Robinson, if you will, of pro rodeo sports for black people. And it's people like him, Murder Steitman, who said, I'm going to carve this path regardless, he, uh, Abe Morris ends up standing on his shoulders. Uh, James Pickens, who you may know from Grey's Anatomy. He is someone who also ropes, and so he's able to stand on the forefathers and foremothers who said, I'm marginalized because of my race or gender. I'm going to find a different way to circumnavigate the, the, the laws of the land and still be able to ride and be part of my passion. Tell us about the man who invented bulldogging. Ah, Bill Pickett. He is actually really incredible. And the more I learn about him, the more I'm just fascinated with him. So Bill Pickett is someone who's credited with bulldogging. One of the things that he ended up doing was he was watching one day. He said, you know, how can I figure out how to get these bulls more subdued? And so one day he was watching how the, the sheep dogs, you know, the dogs who go around and herd the cattle and whatnot, he noticed that these big cows and bulls would be subdued if the dog went up and bit them on the lip. And so he said, hmm, I wonder if I should try something like that. So one day he's out there and he's becoming one with the animal, so to speak. And he's saying, you know, he's really, it's, it's, a, it's a contest between him and the animal as to who's going to best whom. And eventually he gets around the bull, he bites, the bull has a, it has a ring, he bites the ring and subdues the animal. And it's really quite, quite incredible. And that's how we have steer wrestling or bulldogging today. I'm going to watch for that at Cheyenne Frontier Days this year. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's, I mean, it's just a feat of athleticism. It's, it's incredible. Well, what happened to women? I know that early on, women were bull riding. They were doing a lot of these things that only men do now. Well, how did they disappear? Absolutely. And women were incredible competitors with men, sometimes besting men. What happens with women is 1929 happens. And 1929 is when Bonnie McCarrow is killed. And after that, many of the Victorian rules that were put upon women who weren't in rodeo suddenly come to women who are in rodeo. So women back then who were in rodeo suddenly found themselves being protected by men. And men saying, you know, this is really too dangerous for you. You are a woman. We need to look after you. This is too dangerous for you. And so suddenly where women felt that they were equal to men within the arena suddenly found themselves boxed out of the arena and being cared for in ways that they hadn't been cared for before and um, by default it, it marginalizes them in their contributions and we see the ripple effect of Bonnie McCarroll's death and the decision by men today. What did she die? She died while she was riding and she had this horrible fall and she'd actually fallen before so this was on her first fall. The second time that she falls in 1929 is she's still alive on, you know, in the arena. It, she, falls, it, she dies after the, after the fall. And so then men say, oh, this is a dangerous sport. We need to protect women. And so that's why you see most women being can chasers or barrel racers today rather than riding bareback and doing some of those other things that they used to be able to do. We have women today who are starting, I call it the back to quality phase, my co-author and I do where we sum up the book from equality to back to equality and what women are doing to be part of the sport again and to challenge some of the restrictions that they felt early on in rodeo. And some of those women like Kayla Muzzle, for example, who is part American Indian and part white, she's really stretching the bounds and norms for women in rodeo today and challenging where women are placed today and saying, you know what, I think I can do this again. And so there are women who are carving the path, but you see that marginalization happen. Dr. Tracy Owens-Patton, thanks for joining us and telling us about your new book. Well, thank you for having me.